This is part six of my series covering obscure sequels to popular NES games. So far, we've covered a bunch of random titles like Ikari 3 The Rescue, Bartman Meets Radioactive Man, and more. A whole video on random educational games, a long look at Bubble Bobble and its four NES sequels, and then recently a look at some titles that didn't exactly sound like follow-ups, like The Moffat Conspiracy and Flying Warriors. This time I'm going to be discussing the ultra-rare sequels that were pretty underwhelming at the time they were released, and have since become big collector's items. All of these titles came out after the introduction of the Super Nintendo, and so even though the games they were following were a big deal, these sequels kind of got lost in the mix against the 16-bit backdrop. I should say though that I'm using the word rare to describe these titles, but a more accurate term is expensive. I don't actually know how many copies of each game were produced or sold, only what the current going price is. There are probably way rarer games out there that fit this bill, but as they are not as sought after by collectors, their price is not quite as high as the dinosaur peaks of the world. With all that in mind, let's jump in. Speaking of which, the granddaddy of all the rare sequels is Flintstone's Surprise at Dinosaur Peak, the third most expensive official NES game after Stadium Events and Little Samson. This one was rumored to have only been released as a blockbuster exclusive, but so far that myth remains unsubstantiated. My copy does look like it was manhandled by many a weekend renter, so I'm gonna go ahead and say that was true. Dinosaur Peak is the sequel to Rescue of Dino and Hoppy, where Fred sets off to save his pets after time traveling Hitler steals them for his temporal zoo. This game is, it's fine, serviceable enough, frustrating as hell at certain parts, creative and surprising in others. Dinosaur Peak looks and plays just like Dino and Hoppy, but with a few new additions. You now play as both Fred and Barney and can switch between them at any time. Fred can still swing the club and climb ledges, and Barney has a slingshot and can hang on wires. There's also a new story where these two deadbeats can't find their kids, and it turns out they're just playing house over by the old active volcano. Gazoo appears to say something about fire dinosaurs and pterodactyls, and this has to be the only NES game to include the word penetrate in its dialogue. I used to really hate this game, as it's a bit clunky and boring, but it is absolutely an upgrade to Dino and Hoppy in every way, with better controls, more level variability, and of course, the switchable characters mechanic. Also, like Dino and Hoppy, it contains my absolute favorite duck animation, where if you press down, Fred's head will disappear like he's a turtle retracted into its shell. And yeah, that technique will not work, ever. Moving down the line, it's the sequel to one of my favorite NES games, Power Blade 2. If you've never played Power Blade, it's basically Mega Man in sunglasses where you toss boomerangs at robots and talk extra close with your undercover bros. It's really fun, and while obviously it owes a lot to Capcom's iconic franchise, there's a lot of distinct qualities to the design, and the core gameplay is really responsive and solid. Considering Power Blade wasn't exactly the most well-known game at the time of its release, it's no surprise that the sequel went largely unnoticed, even though it only came out one year later. The basic jump around and blast enemies with your boomerang mechanic is still here, but the stage design is very different. Instead of the forking paths, find a contact before locating the stage boss layout of Power Blade 1, 2 is much more linear, breaking each level into mini obstacle rooms that eventually end with a boss. There's also these rad new suits that make your main character Nova more powerful and allow him to more easily navigate some of the harder sections. And when I say harder, man, this game is brutal. Power Blade 1 was no picnic, but 2 is the real deal, especially if you choose your stage out of order, as they not only increase in difficulty, but each is more and more reliant on those special power suits. While the graphics do appear better in some areas, the overall look and feel is way less sharp and distinct. There are some neat ideas here, but overall Power Blade 2 cannot and does not hold up to the original. The label for Chip and Dale's Rescue Rangers 2 doesn't usually look this jacked up, but man, this may be the most desecrated cartridge in my collection. Jesus. The first Rescue Rangers game was pretty popular, a simple action platformer starring the Chipmunk Brothers and the rest of their motley crew. The follow-up didn't come out until 1994, the very last year of the NES's life in North America. Despite four years distance between their releases, 
there's really not a ton different about Rescue Rangers 2. The graphics are only slightly improved, the controls are all the same except there's an added super throw ability, and there are these great animated cutscenes. Otherwise, it's pretty cut and paste. I do love though that both games utilize two player simultaneous co-op, which is a tough combo in platformers, but can lead to some fun and unintentionally hilarious moments. My biggest beef with both these games is, what's with all the boxes? Throwing stuff is your only method of attack, so it makes sense to have some of these available, but we're talking a ratio of like 20 boxes per enemy. Sure, some have the equivalent of coins that can equal extra lives, or an acorn which can restore health, but finding them means turning over 15 empty boxes to find one full one. It's incredibly tedious, but being able to hide in the box while bad guys walk into you is a nice touch. Sucker! Of the two, I don't know. They're pretty much the same experience to me, so number two, follow your heart. Despite owning most of these games for years now, I'm often surprised and a little embarrassed that there are still NES titles I've never played. Well, guess what? I've never touched these Dungeons and Dragons games. Reverse nerd alert! I think I heard D&D and thought first person dungeon crawlers, which have their place in history, but I personally cannot stick with one for more than a minute or two. Turns out each of these games is really different and not at all what I was expecting. Heroes of the Lances, I have no idea. You walk around with a party 30 deep, awkwardly stabbing at enemies and man, this looks awful. I'm pretty sure there's more subtlety to the party usage or magic or something, but I don't know. The second game, Pool of Radiance, is, yep, this is my nightmare. You start out in a town where the computer controls you as it gives you a virtual tour of identical looking doors and hallways. You're killing me here. I'm not hating, I know a lot of people love this style of old school RPG, but it ain't for me. I got into one fight where all two of my dudes were killed immediately, and that's plenty. The third game, Dragon Strike, is a shooter? Not even that, it's basically an open area where you can fly your dragon around in any direction. Each stage has a different mission to accomplish, like blow up all the boats or destroy all the dragons. This kinda rules, I'm coming back to this later. Finally, there's the fourth and final D&D game of them all, Adventures of Dungeons and Dragons Hillsfar. All of these games are surprisingly rare, but Hillsfar is especially so, currently going for almost double the price of Dragon Strike. What's it like? Well, it's kind of a combination of Heroes of the Lance and Pool of Radiance. You make your character, leave your campground, perpetually get flung headfirst off your horse, and then you're in the city. There's lots of doors to explore, including occasionally big open spaces. You're not supposed to be in these spots, so you have a time limit to explore and raid chests before the guards show up. There's also a tavern where I got arrested for trying to set it on fire, and I had to fight this dude to the death to gain my freedom. Brutal. I don't understand any of this, but it is kind of interesting, and there are lots of D&D elements like discovering traps and multiple interaction options in this tavern. What happens beyond this city I have no idea, as this part alone bored me to tears, but I could see with a little orientation and some trial and error, Hillsfar might actually be kind of fun. Who knows? It's honestly hard to call these games sequels, as aside from the Dungeons and Dragons name in their titles, they're nothing alike in style or gameplay, and in fact, were each programmed by entirely different developers. I'd really need to spend more time with each of these to say which is better one way or another, but on initial inspection, I'd say Dragon Strike seems the most promising. And now for something completely and totally different, it's DuckTales 2! Unlike whatever was happening between the Dungeons and Dragons games, DuckTales 2 does not rock the boat, sticking to the tried and true formula of pogo stomping your enemies and racking up hidden loot. However, like many great sequels, DuckTales 2 takes everything that worked about the first one and just kept piling on new ideas. Scrooge's cane can now pull rocks, hang on these hoops, and even do an awkward jump golf swing. Then there's all these objects that can't be moved or destroyed, but in certain levels you'll find Gyro, who will then upgrade your cane even further to then manipulate or remove these obstacles. It's pretty cool, adding even more allure to the exploration draw of the gameplay, while also creating a need to backtrack to past levels and try out your new abilities. 
There's also some pretty tricky puzzles that can alter the environment entirely, and even hidden map pieces in each stage that in turn open up a final level. It's pretty amazing. And while DuckTales 2 generally looks and feels so much like the original in every way as to be kind of predictable, these added elements make the game experience last a little longer. And as such, as much as I love the first one, I actually think DuckTales 2 is maybe the overall better game in terms of fun and replayability, if not pure nostalgia. One of the best series on the NES was the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles games, which started out as a rad but difficult action title, followed by an excellent co-op beat-em-up, followed by an even more excellent beat-em-up, and finally a 1v1 fighter. On the NES proper, there are only a handful of games that feature this kind of battling, like Double Dragon or Flying Warriors, but the only true 1v1 fighter I can think of is Karate Champ, which is barely a game. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Tournament Fighter is a full Street Fighter style fighting game with a heap of characters with different normal attacks and special moves. It is a way, way, way downgraded version of the 16-bit Super Nintendo counterpart, but considering the limitations of both the hardware and the NES controller, it's kind of a marvel. Tournament Fighters for NES seems like Konami was already working on the Genesis and Super Nintendo versions and just wanted to challenge themselves with an 8-bit try. I doubt anyone will play this for too long, as it's not at all easy and pretty repetitive, but if you're like me, it's kind of enjoyable just to absorb what is ultimately a very well-made and unique title for the system. The Indiana Jones games are ones I've talked about a bit on this channel. There's the spatially confusing conveyor belt extravaganza that is Temple of Doom, the very decent but challenging platformer The Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, and the two-for-one Last Crusade titles that, despite their incredibly similar covers, are actually two totally different games made by two totally different developers. The title one is a series of mini-games ranging from beat-em-up to maze exploration to one of those move-the-tile-around puzzle games. It is very true to the film, with ideas and locations taken straight out of the script like this rad Jehovah puzzle. <laughs> Amazing. The other identically titled Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade was made by Ubisoft and looks like this. Wah, wah. This was one of the first titles where I realized that at the end of the NES's lifespan, developers started designing games for the handheld Game Boy and then slightly colorizing them for dual release on the NES. The result is a slow, unresponsive mess that looks like the first draft of a game that should have never been released. Obviously, this title was an afterthought for Ubisoft at the time, and as such, was kind of an afterthought for consumers as well. The destroyer of cities and monsters alike, Godzilla, got two games on the NES. The first title is this weird grid strategy game where Godzilla and Mothra move like chess pieces, battling tiny ships and um, rocks, before eventually moving into some one-on-one -on -one fights with these weirdos. If I had to use one word to describe it, it would be tedious. The stages are all exactly the same, and damn if I can figure out any strategy for the bosses other than mashing the attack button like crazy. Sometimes they just slap you relentlessly so you can't move, at all, for a full 20 seconds. Wow. The sequel, Godzilla 2, War of the Monsters, is... Well, they really went all in on the strategy approach. Now you control the humans defending against Godzilla or other monsters. The action is move your troops around, engage the enemies in a brief turn-based single move battle, rinse and repeat. Surely there's more to the game than just that, like there's buildings that can probably add something to your arsenal, and scientists that you can hit up for sciency advice like, I can't help you. That's okay, in this game, I can barely help myself. Maybe I'll give this a longer look in the future, but... Probably not. Oddly enough, considering its origins, Godzilla 2 is one of those few games that was only released in North America, not even getting a release in Japan of all places. Weird, never would have guessed. I doubt that has much to do with its rarity, but of all the sequels on this list, this is the one I honestly have no clue as to why it's so expensive these days. I mean, come on, just look at that cover. It practically screams, buy me. Bomberman is the classic, uh, what do you call this kind of game? top-down action? It's somewhere between Pac-Man and Legend of Zelda, if that makes sense. Anyway, the first Bomberman is extremely simple. It's arcade-style, one screen, blow up all the enemies, and move on to the next level action. 
You start with the weakest bomb attack, which makes killing enemies incredibly tedious. There are upgrades, but only one per stage hidden amongst all these blocks, which means you have to slowly and systematically blow up everything just to get a little slightly stronger. I'm not complaining really, just if you've played any of the later titles, starting again with the OG Bomberman is bound to feel a bit sluggish. The sequel, Bomberman 2, is a major improvement in every way. First of all, there's a story. This other Bomberman robs a bank and then immediately frames your guy who then gets arrested and hauled off to jail. I think that means all these levels are just Bomberman fighting for his life in prison. That's bleak. The graphics are much nicer, the colors are more diverse and vibrant, and the already catchy music from the first one got remixed to jammin' levels. The gameplay is very much the same as the first, but sped up. Fireman 2 is way more refined than Part 1, and even features multiplayer with the NES 4 score or satellite. Although for some reason you can only play with 3 players, even though those adapters support 4 controllers. Weird. Casino Kid are two words you never hear together in a sentence, but hey, it's the title of not one, but two NES games. As you can guess, these titles are gambling simulators, but they're surprisingly way more in depth than Vegas Dream or Caesar's Palace. If you've never played Casino Kid, it's basically a betting RPG where you walk around the casino talking to people, gaining intel on other players, and then challenging folks one by one in either poker or blackjack. While it is ultimately just playing those two card games with some extra dialogue and find an opponent searching thrown in there, it has a lot of charm to it and some funny interactions like this lady who says she's going to give me a lipstick kiss? Oh boy! Casino Kid 2 takes place directly after the first, where now as Casino Champion of America, you have to defend your title against this international crew of Mr. Sinisters. To do that, you've got to travel to gambling hubs all over the world, Street Fighter style. Also, in addition to poker and blackjack, now there's roulette. Honestly, this may be the one game that I don't feel like it improved on its predecessor in any way. The idea is cool, but I enjoy the wandering around the casino talking to randos much more than the straightforward roam the world map and beat each master at their respective game. Whew, and that's it for the 10 rarest sequels for the NES. Some of these I'll come back to later for a more in-depth review, and others, not so much. There are still plenty more obscure sequels to popular NES games to cover, so stay tuned for another edition soon. Also, a quick note, I have talked about a few rare sequels that probably would have made this list already in this series, including Bubble Bobble 2, Fire and Ice, and Donkey Kong Jr. Math, so I'll link to the other videos in this series down in the description. Huge shout out to my buddy Hayden Loves Anime, who joined my Patreon and for whom I've made this sign. They mentioned they loved a Famicom exclusive I've never heard of, Ninja Jajamaru Ginga Daisakusen, which I incorporated into their drawing and which now I'm having a ton of fun playing. Thanks Hayden! If you like my videos and want to see more, head on over to patreon.com slash words where I'm sharing weekly bonus videos. I'm also streaming a new game every Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here on YouTube, so come hang. Until next time, thanks for watching.